Hello Year 9 and welcome to today's lesson. Before we start, a knowledge retrieval task. Uh, I'd like to answer the following questions. Um, this should take about five minutes. Question 1. What is a passive audience? Question 2. What is an audience effects theory? Question 3. What is hypodermic syringe theory? Question 4. Why is hypodermic syringe theory often used to describe audience behaviour? Question five, what are the problems with hypodermic syringe theory? It should take you about five minutes to answer those questions. Uh, when you've done so, please move on to the next slide. You can check your answers.
From a passive audience is an audience which reacts rather than challenges or actively uses the media. Basically, an audience which uh, allows the media to influence it rather than challenging the media. An audience effects theory basically explains passive audience. It's just the media has an effect on the audience rather than the audience influencing the media. Hypodermic syringe theory is a very extreme form of effects theory. It suggests that audiences are easily influenced and controlled by the media to control acts of violence or depict antisocial behaviour and that basically they have no control over how they're influenced by the media's messages. Why is hypodermic syringe often used to describe audience behaviour? It's used basically when bad things happen for an excuse as to why they've happened, looking for someone to blame, uh, justify censorship or to shift blame when when things go wrong, particularly in political terms. Problems with uh, hypodermic syringe based on flawed evidence, particularly at the Bobo doll experiment, um, it's impossible to actually prove it, and it does lead to moral panic, so it actually make things worse. Basically, hypodermic syringe theory has a kind of intuitive quality in that we think there is going to be this causal link between the media and people's behaviour, and there is there is like evidence that suggests there might be, but it is not the only factor. The media is not generally the thing that is only to blame. Today we're looking at a theory called cultivation theory, which is another effects theory. It's a slightly less extreme version of hypodermic syringe. Um, and cultivation theory basically suggests that repeated contact with a message will influence attitudes and values. Basically, the idea is that uh, you get desensitized. If you con are continually exposed to a message, eventually, a bit like the sea, washing away at a rock, it will have an effect on you. So it's not like hypodermic syringe, it's not a knee-jerk reaction. It is over time, for example, if you experience violent events in the media, you're going to be less shocked by violence. Um, so the idea with the cultivation theory is it, you know, it cultivates you like a plant, it grows in you. So the implication is that if you watch a lot of violent movies, you are going to be less, you'll be more tolerant of violence. Does that mean that you're going to go out and behave violently? Well, probably not, but it might change your attitudes to violence. Now, it is suggested by some critics that there's a difference between fictional violence and real violence, because generally violence depicted in films is not realistic. It's not how it would be in reality. And so what we're watching is an interpretation of violence and that actually seeing something in the context of a drama is very different to seeing it in real life and therefore the audience can interpret what's going on. And it is worth noting that millions and millions of members of the audiences watch crime dramas, watch dramas with violence and death on TV and films and computer games but there aren't millions and millions of people going out committing acts of violence. So um, that idea of um, film and TV leading people to behave violently is maybe not particularly uh, in evidence. And it doesn't take into account that there are, as we've discussed with hypodermic syringe theory, other factors which will affect uh, how you behave, other contextual factors, both in your own personal life and in terms of the social and cultural worlds. So the media doesn't exist in isolation, therefore you can't just blame the media. Um, another aspect which we've mentioned before of cultivation theory is called mean world syndrome. And that's the idea that if you if you read too much bad news or if you watch too much negative um, drama that suggests the world is a dangerous or frightening place, that you actually come to believe that. And obviously, in, in dramas, the world is a dangerous place for the protagonists because otherwise there wouldn't be any drama. Um, cultivation theory suggests that you begin to believe that that's what the world's like and, and it affects your actual perspective of your world, which maybe isn't the same as the fictional world you're seeing in drama. So what I'd like to do is, in your own words, please, not in my words, describe cultivation theory. And then move on to the next slide. Now, 
Um, cultivation theory, I did sort of say that it's very hard to prove, but it, it does explain how certain things happen because it is clear that people do believe what they see in the media. And I mean, the, 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 the activities of Donald Trump early this year in his attempt to overturn the results of the US election demonstrate that, that, that he managed over time to cultivate the idea in millions of people that the election result was corrupt. And he'd been doing that for months. So there is evidence that people over time can be influenced. But in this case, it wasn't the media that was influencing them. It was it was an individual who was using various media platforms. And so the media itself wasn't responsible for Stop the Steal. Uh, it was, was, you know, it was simply the conduit that was used by Trump and his cronies. Um, we also saw examples before the elections in 1997, 1999, where a number of newspapers spent a lot of time attacking Jeremy Corbyn, who was the Labour leader. Now, I'm, 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 I'm not a big fan of Corbyn. Um, and there is some evidence of anti-Semitism, and, and that basically means anti-Jewish attitudes in the Labour Party. But I don't think it was anything like as prevalent as the newspaper suggested. But a lot of people now do genuinely believe that not only was Jeremy Corbyn particularly anti-Semitic, but the Labour Party is an anti-Semitic Labour uh, anti-Semitic party. Those same newspapers did not emphasise rather negative attitudes in some areas of the Conservative Party towards Muslims, even though those attitudes do exist. Brexit is another example. Um, Brexit was very, very heavily promoted, particularly in um, right-wing tabloid newspapers, as being a very, very good thing, uh, uh, with attitudes uh, against Brexit being presented in a very negative way. and. Um, and that has obviously shaped people's attitudes a lot towards um, the Brexit, uh, towards the Brexit vote when it happened and towards supporting Brexit, even though a lot of experts, a lot of evidence suggested that it was going to be not so good for a lot of people. Um, over his four year presidency, Donald Trump systematically attacked media organizations and um, re le reaching a point when a lot of Trump supporters will not accept what they see in what's called the mainstream media. So effectively, um, na uh, national news networks and things like that, because they don't agree with what Trump is do was doing. And effectively, that, that undermined and in some cases destroyed trust in the media. And as I mentioned, Trump's accusations of election fraud um, became, for some people, the prevalent truth because they were repeated so often. So effectively, what we're looking at is hypodermic syringe over time. We're not looking at a, an immediate injection that you react to. We're looking at a, a systematic and um, developing change in your attitude because the media is constantly drip feeding you ideas and eventually you come to believe them because you keep seeing them reinforced. So using some of those examples, please add to your definite theory. Just a bit of background on cultivation theory. It was developed by a guy called Gerbner in the 1960s and the 1970s and basically it's focused on television and uh, it, it suggests that the people who are high frequency viewers of television basically people who watch a lot of television tend to believe what they see in the media more uh, and that heavy viewers exposed to more violence become affected by what Gerbner called mean world syndrome <laughs> The idea that the world's a far worse and far more dangerous place than it actually is. They believe that the world they see on the television is the world that they live in, even though the world on the television is a highly fictionalised version of the world. So heavy views of TV are thought to be cultivating attitudes to the world. 
uh, that makes them believe the world created by television is an accurate depiction of the real world. And uh, we effectively extrapolate that to other media forms, films, newspapers, adverts, and so on and so forth. Basically, the, the more you look at, the more you believe that the world of the media is the real world rather than the mediated world that we know that it is. And and Gerbner suggested that prolonged watching a television can change the way you believe about violence. And and on the one hand, that is your general belief about the world, that the world's a more violent, dangerous place. But depending upon the media you watch or experience, you can become specific have specific focuses, you know, hatred or reverence for law, for particular groups, just pedophiles and things like that. Um, so effectively your attitudes are developed over time and theory suggests that cultivation of attitudes is based on attitudes that already exist in society what happens the media takes those attitudes and packages them represents them bundles them to different audiences so gerbner isn't saying the media creates these opinions if he is saying the media reinforces them and develops them in particular ways that people are influenced by the media representations rather than challenging them. What I'd like you to do is like to think about whether or not you agree with this. Do you agree that um, the media influences attitudes over time or do you think that the media is is not as influential as Gerbner suggested. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to to come with one argument for or an argument against cultivation theory. Do you agree? Do you disagree? So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to write a paragraph explaining your point of view. All right. So that's cultivation theory. We're now moving on to our third uh, effects theory. This is called two-step flow. This is an interesting one because this combines ideas of active and passive audiences. Um, so basically, two-step flow suggests the media itself is not only an influential uh, force on audience attitudes, but basically what happens is it's part of a larger system and that the, the media is only one factor in influencing audiences. So basically, if you look at the diagram there, what you've got is the media, and the media then passes messages not directly to the audience, but to what are called opinion leaders. And opinion leaders are people that you will listen to. So they will interpret the media for you. They will interpret news stories for you. Um, and opinion leaders don't necessarily need to be people who are on the television they don't necessarily need to be like pundits or reporters or experts they can be people you know people you trust people's opinions that you value because either you see them as knowledgeable or they're very good at presenting their ideas so in this case it would be like somebody sees something on facebook and passes it on to you and you believe it uh, or someone is telling you about a particular event based on their experience of the news and you believe them so effectively you are not being directly influenced by the media. What's happening is someone else has experienced a media product and said, this is what I think of it. And then that information is passed to you. So basically, anybody that you uh, listen to and whose opinion you follow could be regarded as an opinion leader. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to copy the diagram and I'd like you to describe two-step uh, two flow in your books. And the, what happens here is that you can actually learn about things. You can actually be told about things without experiencing yourself. So you might hear about a news story from somebody else without actually seeing that news story. So you're getting that news story secondhand. Similarly, Somebody might tell you about a game or a film or a TV program and you might not ever watch that, but you might um, feel that you've experienced it because somebody's told you about it, an opinion leader, in other words. Um, within the media, what can happen is you might find particular people that you trust, people that you listen to, and they become your... Um, your your opinion leader so please write down this uh, 
description of two-step flow and, and do a copy of the model in your book and then move on to the next slide. So there are there are plenty of examples where this this model works um, because we do still listen to opinion leaders. Um, we listen to people who are much the day who tell us what to think about a game. We we see expert correspondents in the news tell us what to think about political situation. Newspaper editorials is quite a famous example, which I think we've mentioned before to do with Russell Brand. Uh, and I won't I won't tell you this about Russell Brand now, but there's a link there you can find out about Russell Brand um, and uh, Brexit again. You could argue that Boris Johnson acted as an opinion leader for Brexit and influenced a lot of people. Um, newspapers often contain opinion pieces which uh, tell you what to think, um, and indeed influencers such as uh, Zoella or Kim Kardashian who can effectively influence millions of people's behavior based on what they're doing on, on YouTube or TikTok or whatever. So we do see plenty of examples of two-step flow in action. And I'd say YouTube and uh, social media influencers are probably the most the most prevalent uh, in, in, my, in my opinion. Um, so what I'd like to do now is I'd like to spend about 20 minutes just looking through these links uh, giving you a bit more information about the various effects theories that we've looked at. Uh, there's uh, links to Wikipedia articles, there's links to various um, YouTube videos that you'll find interesting, um, just a lot of background information and uh, you won't be able to link to these directly from this video, you'll have to go through the, uh, um, the assignment. So please do that and then have a go at the question on the next slide. So in your books, write a paragraph answering the following question. How far do you agree with effects theories? How much does the media influence the audience? Consider hypodermic syringe, cultivation theory, two-step flow. What's the evidence for? What's the evidence against? So write a paragraph answering that question. When you're finished, please uh, photograph your work, attach it, upload it, turn it in, and that is it.